Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar exploring the complicated issue of privacy for Australian employers. I'm Ray Welling, Editor-in-Chief of Workplace Info, and today we're going to look at how the dust is settling on the new Australian privacy principles after six months in force. We're also going to take a look at a new report released on privacy invasion in the digital era and how that's likely to affect your business in the future. Joining our panel of experts today is Marcus Bagnell, a lawyer specializing in privacy with the Australian Business Lawyers and Advisors, and Dr. Stephen Robertson, Legal Officer with the Australian Law Reform Commission. Marcus, Stephen, welcome. First off, as always, if you have any technical issues or if you'd like to post a question to our panelists, you can do that by typing your query into the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. We've received several questions in the lead up to this webinar and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can during the time we have together or as follow-up. I'd like to point out that the information provided in the webinar today is general information only, so it doesn't take into account your own particular work situation or your objectives or needs. Before you act on any information contained in this discussion, you need to consider the appropriateness of the information having regard to your own objectives, work and financial situation and needs. Marcus, let's start by looking at what the new Australian privacy principles mean for Australian businesses. What is some of the new terminology that employers have to get their head around? Right, so uh, thanks a lot for that, Ray. So the, the first section of today's webinar will be looking at, um, in particular, the Australian privacy principles, or the APPs, and um, that's one of the um, key changes that were brought into the Privacy Act and the privacy regime earlier this year. Um, and then the latter part of the first part will look at some tips for compliance that um, everyone can hear hopefully apply in their respective workplaces. Um, so before we begin, just a, a couple of key concepts um, which I'm sure you're already aware of. So the APPs regard the management of what's called personal information. Now personal information um, is anything which um, can be uh, used to identify or that can be reasonably used to identify a particular person. Um, so if this applies, then you're dealing with personal information. So that will include someone's name, someone's contact details, someone's address details, all of those sorts of things, if that's collected or used by your organisation, would be included in the definition of personal information. And if so, you need to then consider how your organisation might need to comply with the Privacy Act. Um, another category of information which is also a thing to keep in mind is also sensitive information. And this is a special subcategory of personal information um, and there's some examples here of, here of what that means. But um, the thing to note is if your organisation deals with sensitive information, um, then it means there's a high level of compliance and a high level of obligations which will attach to that sort of information. Um, so for example, there are m many situations in which if you're dealing with sensitive information, for example, if you're collecting someone's health details or their beliefs about certain things, um, then, you, then you'll need to get their consent to do so and their consent to disclose it and use it. Um, so if that's you, then keep that in mind as we go through um, the information today. So I'll try to get through the APPs as quickly as possible to leave more time at the end for questions. And, and as Ray mentioned, um, feel free to use the, um, the question function to submit them through to us. Uh, the APPs, there are 13 of them, and they can be generally categorised into the, the following five, as you can see in this diagram. So let's kick off on the first one. The first one regards a very broad overview of how you're supposed to manage personal information. Um, and practically speaking, this is um, personified by having a privacy policy that complies with the obligations under the APPs. Um, obligations include, for example, you must make that freely available, um, and typically this, in, in this day and age, is made available on your website. So anyone can access this um, policy via the website and obviously it has to be made free of charge. Um, and this privacy policy, in effect, would form the backbone of your organisation's compliance with the Act. Um, it'll contain various things which the Act says it must contain, but practically speaking, it'll contain processes and procedures that your organisation proposes to um, put in place in order for you to not only comply with the Act, but also to ensure that the privacy outcomes are being delivered by your organisation um, in accordance with the Act. APP2 
Um, this requires you to give individuals the option of dealing with your organisation anonymously or using a pseudonym. So where there's, where there's no real requirement for the person's actual personal information and details to be collected, then, it, then that option should be provided. Um, obviously, there's scenarios in which it doesn't work. So, for example, if you need to do billing information or scenarios where you need to identify the person for particular purposes, and if you don't want to offer this option, then obviously you can tell that person that if you want to use your pseudonym, then we, for example, cannot provide you the full level of services that you might otherwise request. Um, but certainly as a base position, um, the APPs do require you to provide this option when dealing with people and when dealing with the collection of personal information. APP3 um, regards a concept what they call collecting solicited personal information. So that's where um, you have taken an active step in order to collect that information from that particular individual. For example, by submitting a, a form for them to fill out, that's obviously taking a step to get that information. And, and a guiding principle here is that you should only collect information that is reasonably necessary for one or more of your business functions or activities. Um, if you do not need that information for your business functions or activities, or if it's, for example, not included in your privacy policy, that might be one grounds for the conclusion that that information might not actually be necessary for your business functions or activities. There's also a high level of compliance for sensitive information. So if we're dealing with sensitive information, then you must also get their consent to do so. So that's one example of a high level of compliance that attaches to sensitive information. And often the purpose for collecting information is one example of a, a concept or, or a detail that should be expressed clearly in the privacy policy for your organisation. So ideally the policy would set out all the purposes for which your business wants to collect that information. And Policy would also then deal with the the um, the use of it, disclosure of it, etc. But when it comes to the purpose for collection, um, the guiding principle is you must make sure that it's necessary for one of your functions or activities. The next APP regards dealing with unsolicited information, so ones in which you did not take a step to collect it. So, for example, the information was passed on to you without you requesting it or without your knowledge. Those are some examples of that. And the guiding principle here is that if you could not have collected it under APP3, in other words, if that unsolicited information uh, was not necessary for your business activities or would not normally be requested under the usual circumstances, then you cannot actually keep it. And this APP requires you to destroy or de-identify that information as soon as you can. So for example, um, there might be a, a recruitment scenario where you aren't currently looking for a, a candidate and you were provided with something that you didn't actually request. If you wouldn't normally be asking that for that, for that sort of information, then that could fall under what's called unsolicited personal information, and this APP now requires you to destroy or anonymise that information. So that's another example of, of one of the um, compliance requirements under the APPs. All right, um, APP5 deals with what's called a collection notice. And this is a concept which um, quite a few may not be aware of, um, in which whenever you collect personal information, this now sets out what you must inform that individual of at the point or as soon as you can after you actually do the collection. So when that occurs, you need to tell them, for example, your details, how you collected it, the purpose for the collection, how you're going to disclose it, and any likely overseas disclosures. Now, practically speaking, um, this can be dealt with by referring to your privacy policy at the point of collection, and obviously the privacy policy should already cover these grounds or, or these things which that collection notice must, must contain. Many other org organisations are also preparing a specific collection notice that's actually given to the individual um, at the point that they actually collect the information. So there's a few different ways to comply with this obligation depending on your organisation and, and the way that you actually do things. Uh, but certainly this APP now prescribes in detail the things that you must tell the individual at the point that you collect the information. The next part regards use and disclosure. So following on from the purposes for the collection of the information, 
Um, APP6 prescribes how you can only use or disclose the personal information for the purpose for which you collected in the first place. And this what's called, it is what's called the primary purpose. Now you can also use or disclose the information for a related or a secondary purpose, um, but only if, one, the person would reasonably expect that secondary purpose, or ideally the person has consented to it. So if you want to collect information but you want to use it for a thing which is not exactly as what you described to them, but is a related purpose, um, the best way to deal with that is, for example, to cover that off in your privacy policy and in the collection notice um, to expressly state for it for that particular purpose to be what you're going to be using it for. But if you haven't expressly got that consent or if you haven't expressly put it to them, you need to then think of would someone reasonably expect me to do or to, to use the information for that particular purpose? So for example, if you've collected information for, for, for someone's contact details and you want to contact them for further um, information or provide them with more services, um, if you're happy that they would reasonably expect you to do so, then you can do that. But if you can't actually come to that conclusion, then you could have a problem under APP6 compliance. So these are some of the guiding principles that um, you should keep in mind when it comes to using and disclosing personal information that you've collected. Okay, so here's an example um, from a couple of years ago um, of where um, the, there was a complaint uh, under what used to be called the National Privacy Principle Number 2 that regard use and disclosure of personal information. Now what happened here is that the, um, the complainant was a um, member of, of the Wentworthville Leagues Club and they, this person attended the club and the club maintained that person's details, records of how often they attended, gaming information and that sort of thing. Um, that person was going through a marital breakup and the complainant's ex-partner um, arranged for a subpoena to be served on the club um, for information regarding the complainant's gaming activities uh, to be provided to the court. Um, the club inadvertently then provided the gaming information to the ex-partner and not the court. And the ex-partner then went off and disclosed that information to family, friends, anyone they wanted to hear. And then not surprisingly, the complainant then lodged a complaint against the club. Um, long story short, the um, it was determined that there was a breach of the use and disclosure obligation because obviously the complainant would not have provided the information to the club um, knowing or expecting that that information would, dis would be disclosed by the club to the ex-partner, um, in this case in relation to a marital breakup. Um, there was a fine and the club had to um, instigate training procedures for its staff, um, but that's one example of a breach of the use and disclosure requirement in that you can only use and disclose personal information for the purpose in which you collected it, and if you disclose it for a different purpose, then that could be a breach under what would now be the APPs. Now, um, Marcus, you mentioned that that one's from yep. a couple of years ago. Is the fact that the privacy principles have been updated, is, that, is there any, would that case be handled right. differently today? Um, well, the or? MPPs, um, quite a few of the MPPs are preserved in the APPs. There are some new APPs, but certainly the APP to do with use and disclosure is extremely similar. So if, if a similar scenario were to arise under the APPs, the result would be the same. And in fact, I'll come to it later, but there's um, more hefty uh, fines and penalties that can be imposed. So it's possible that a more serious breach could lead to even greater penalties under the new regime. Aha, uh -huh. okay. All right. APP7 um, regards direct marketing, and this is the question that crops up a lot these days. Um, I know I certainly get lots of um, emails in my inbox um, following signing up to some product online that I may not necessarily have expected, and what APP7 requires is that an organisation can't use, disclose, or disclose personal information um, unless they comply with this particular APP. There's a few things which you must do when using personal information for direct marketing purposes. Um, you must always provide an opt-out procedure that's clear and that's simple to use. And obviously, if you receive an opt-out request, you must then comply with that request promptly. So for example, um, in, a, in a direct marketing email, the opt-out option or the unsubscribe option can't be in small text on the bottom. It must be made clear. 
Vista, for example, it should be in the same font size as everything else. Um, there shouldn't be five or ten screens to, to click through to get to the opt-out um, step. Um, and if, for example, an organisation has bought a list, for example, from another company that contains contact details for people, then that organisation, if requested by the individual, must provide the source for the information. So, for example, if I signed up um, for a, a subscription for information for company A, and company A then disclosed my details to company B to market stuff to me, one, that might be an issue because they didn't collect the information and tell me that they'll be disclosing it for that purpose. But then company B must then provide the source of the information if they were to contact me and I were to request it. So there's, there's a few extra compliance requirements there around direct marketing. And that, that I think, is also in response to the explosion of, of email subscriptions and, and, and mailing lists that, that, um, and that has led to quite a few complaints, particularly in the past few years. Okay, APP8. Um, this is a, an example of one which is a lot more prescriptive under the APPs compared to the MPPs. Um, and this is also a particular issue given these days with um, IT systems and information which is freely flowing via the internet. And in this case, for this purpose, um, information which is increasingly stored overseas. So the, the APP requires that if you are going to be disclosing information overseas to an overseas recipient, then you must ensure that the overseas recipient doesn't breach the APPs unless you get the individual that you collected the information from to consent to this disclosure, or you believe that the overseas recipient is located somewhere with a similar privacy regime. So, and the, the consequence of not doing this is that if you disclose the information overseas and the overseas recipient breaches the APPs, so any of the APPs, then it'll be you as the organisation as the organisation that collects the information, there would be you that would be in breach and you that would face enforcement issues if that, if that were to arise. So for example, if you were to collect someone's personal information and you were to store it on a server which is located in the US or in Asia somewhere, so overseas, then that's an example of an overseas disclosure and that's where you, for example, would need to be thinking of inserting relevant clauses into the privacy policy or ideally getting consent from people that they consent to you disclosing the, the information overseas. Um, so that's one which people may not realise, but if they think of the IT infrastructure, that's where the issue might actually come into effect, practically speaking. All right, APP9 quite simply means that you can't adopt a, gov a government identifier to identify individuals. So for example, um, you can't then use people's Medicare numbers to identify people within your own system. Um, there are some exemptions, but that's the, the key thing to know here. All right, the next few APPs deal with um, the quality and the ability to access and correct a, um, personal information that you've collected. Um, and these, these now require you to take steps to ensure that your systems are up to date. So practically speaking, um, you might then need to have a, a process in place to then ask people to update the information, seek clarification, or if you know the information is out of date, you then need to take steps to ensure that what information you've got is up to date, um, because the obligation now is that you must actually take steps to ensure that it's up to date, and that if it's not, then that could then be, become a problem for you. Um, now, Marcus, somebody uh, posted a question. They were asking, for an example of a collection statement. So what, what might that look like? Yeah. So under I've seen very short ones which simply say that by submitting the information you agree that you've read our privacy policy and you acknowledge its terms and in doing so they're relying on the fact that the collection statement contents requirements are covered by the privacy policy. So that's an example where too much too many bits of paper is not practical. Um, there are others, for example, you're on the road and, and you're dealing with hard copy. You can't, you can't expect the customer has access to, the, to your website, for example, at the time. So customers might prepare a short half a page collection statement with a number of bullet points which addresses each of the collection statement requirements under APP5. Um, and then there's various permutations of, of the two. Um, so really it comes down to what your company does and realistically speaking, 
how you deal with individuals, how you collect the information, and at what point in the process can you then do this. Don't forget there's also the, the, the ability to do so as soon as reasonably practicable after you collect the information. So if you couldn't do it at the time and you've got reasonable grounds to say we could not give you this statement at the time, as long as you can then say but we did it as soon as we could afterwards, then that's another way that you can comply with that. So for example, you might get the, their details and then provide a, a follow-up email with the, the details required or follow-up letter in the mail depending on how you're dealing with the customer or the individual. Yeah, so it really does depend. Right, okay. All right, um, there's the obligation to ensure um, that the information that you got is kept secure. So there's, there's, there's a two-fold obligation here. One is that you've got to prevent against interference, so un unauthorised um, access. And secondly, you've also got to prevent against unauthorised disclosure. So there's two sides to the same coin. Um, there's also the obligation that if you hold information for which the purpose for collection no longer applies, that there's the obligation to actually destroy or de-identify that, that information. So I think we've got a, an example here. So just going through this quickly, um, a, um, a super fund um, had a website in which members can log on and to manage their accounts. The system had a, there was a potential security issue that the company was aware of, but due to resource issues and other issues, they decided not to deal with it. One of their members um, gained access and actually hacked into the system, gained contact details for all members, contacted all the members, and turns out that this hacker was a white hat hacker who hack deliberately hacks into systems in order to, to identify flaws and then um, offer his services in effect to the company that was affected. Um, this was then brought to the attention of the commissioner and they found that there wasn't a breach of the obligation to ensure against unauthorised disclosure because that wasn't the case. But they did breach the obligation to ensure against unauthorised access because the Superfund was aware of the access issue, but they didn't take proper steps to address it. And it, it wasn't until the hacker actually came along and actually did it that brought that into light. But certainly they found that they failed to take security measures to protect the information from unauthorised access. Okay, and the next two APPs um, require you to um, grant access and also correction rights to people to to their personal information. Um, there's, a, there's a prescriptive process in which um, you must do this, um, but certainly if you get a request from someone to view what personal information that you've got of them or to correct what personal information that you're holding um, in relation to them, um, then there is a process here that you must comply with. Um, there are grounds to not grant access, for example, if it's vexatious or, or frivolous, um, but certainly the, the starting point position is that you must give this right to access and correct personal information. Um, and this is also, it also ties in with the obligation to uh, ensure that the information that you've got is up to date. So if someone's obviously trying to correct the information and has told you that the information that you've got on them is not up to date, then that APP ties in with this APP as well in which you must also grant correction rights to that person to correct the personal information. And um, obviously, if you, do, if you make a decision not to grant the, the access or correction request, um, there's also requirements under the APP 13 as to what the reasons are for refusing that request. Okay. Um, the next little bit, we'll look at what's called the employee records exemption. So under the Act, um, there is a specific exemption from compliance with it if the particular act of practice relates to a current or a former employment relationship between you and the individual and it's about an employee record. So note how this only regards current or former employment relationship records. It doesn't regard future records. So for instance, it will not apply to um, potential recruitment and candidate information. So if you were to receive that from someone, even though later on they might then become an employee, um, before that point, whatever that you've received from that individual, um, if it, for example, contains personal information, 
then that would then need to be complied with, uh, or, the, or the management of it would need to be compli in compliance with the APPs. Um, but if the record that you've um, got or maintain about them is in relation to their, to their current or um, former employment, then the APPs in respect of that employee record will not need to be complied with. And um, Stephen will also talk um, through more about um, implications there and some of the um, ALIC findings as well. Um, and another question that we've also seen and questions that come up in the past, um, so for example, there's quite a few scenarios in which there's an interplay between your records and the involvement of third parties. So for example, there might be an investigation by an external investigator. So um, one view is that even though you as the employer would then apply, rely on the employee records exemption in relation to any personal information that you're holding about the employer, employee, sorry, the investigator as an external party would not be able to rely on the employee records exemption because the employee records exemption only, only relates to the employer's um, obligations. The external investigator themselves would then need to comply with the Act if they were in fact were going to be collecting personal information about people and whatever. So there's a bit of a, there's quite a few layers to, to peel there in different scenarios, but that's a starting point position if you were to be in that scenario. Okay, just quickly on, on complaints and enforcement. So there's, there's a few guidelines when it comes to complaints. Um, so if someone is threatening a complaint against you, well, there's a few things they must, they must be satisfied of first. Um, first of all, for example, um, they must go through your own complaints resolution process first. And then after that hasn't been resolved, in which there's a 30-day period, then they can then complain to the um, OAIC. Um, generally, the Commission will try to um, conciliate the matter. It can take a few months to resolve. And there's, a, there's consequences from the complaints process. Um, but one of the big changes under the, the, uh, uh, the amendments to the Act introduces some significant enforcement powers um, for bodies against organisations should they not comply with the Privacy Act and the APPs. And they include being able to conduct investigations, um, accept enforceable undertakings from you, and, but very importantly, there are now pretty hefty penalties that will apply for breaches. And this wasn't the case before, until early, um, prior to earlier this year. And some of the potential penalty, penalties for this serious um, or repeated breaches of privacy include up to $1.7 million for body corporates and um, 340k for individuals. So um, until now, the penalties um, that would apply for breaches really pale a comparison um, to what could apply um, from this point going forward. So that should uh, make you pay attention um, to some of the obligations under the Act. Um, so just very quickly, some, some tips for compliance. So the Act, the Act and the APPs are very prescriptive now in terms of what you must do. So it's, it's a good idea sometimes to appoint a specific, a specific person that's, um, whose role it is to look after your privacy compliance. So you can call that person a privacy officer. Um, if you haven't already done so, you really should look into many of your privacy policy to ensure that it complies with the APPs and with the Act. Um, if needed, you might need to do an audit of how your, your, how, how your organisation deals with personal information. And that order might, might deliver some surprising results and obviously will then need to inform any consequential changes you might need to make to your policy and, and related um, procedures and practices. Um, you might need to um, amend your procedures for collecting and recording personal information. Um, number five, so notice how um, there was a collection notice requirement. So you might need to audit and, and amend how you actually notify people when you collect the information or you need to make sure that this uh, notification now contains the things you must actually ensure it contains. Otherwise, if you don't, you might be in breach of APP5. Um, also note that there's um, requirements to destroy information. So for example, if, if you've collected it for a purpose, so you've got someone's um, resume and you no longer need that resume for the particular purpose, so the job's closed or, the, or a period has passed, then you must now destroy that information. Um, number seven, so as you saw from that example, there's um, earlier there's, there's obligations to ensure against um, unauthorised access. So maybe your IT infrastructure needs to be um, reviewed, not just for your normal IT um, issues, but also to ensure against um, 
unauthorized access to your personal information that you collected. Uh, number eight, so APP8, um, if, you get, if you're in a scenario where you're disclosing information overseas, you might need to audit that and if so, consider getting consents from people, um, getting an indemnity from overseas recipients against their breach of the Act. Um, number nine, um, there's now pres prescri prescriptions on how you're going to be handling complaints, so it's important that you have a, a procedure in place for that whenever you receive a, a privacy complaint so that you can ensure that it's done in a consistent way and also in compliance with the Act and the APPs. And lastly, you might need to um, conduct a, a training program to ensure that all of your relevant staff are aware of privacy issues when they're dealing with um, the personal information that they collect from individuals um, and then obviously um, ma making them informed of the penalties that might apply for non-compliance and but then obviously how you can um, comply as, a, as an organisation. Great, well thanks very much for that Marcus. Uh, now Stephen, the, the Law Reform Commission recently published a report for a government inquiry into serious invasions of privacy in the digital area era. Can you tell us a bit more about that inquiry and your group's contribution to it? Thanks, Ray. Uh, so as background to the ALRC's role, we're a federal agency. Uh, we receive terms of reference from the Attorney General to look into particular areas of law that uh, the government thinks need reform or at least they want to see if there are reforms that need to be made. The most recent one or a, a recent one was uh, the serious invasions of privacy in the digital era inquiry. Uh, just a little bit of background to that particular one on screen. We were given terms of reference in June 2013. Uh, the, the list there is not complete but these are the main ones. Uh, we were asked to look at innovative ways in which the law may reduce serious invasions of privacy in the digital era, the necessity of balancing the value of privacy with other fundamental values including free expression and open justice, the detailed legal design of a statutory cause of action for serious invasions of privacy and the nature and appropriateness of any other legal remedies for redress for serious invasions of privacy. The third one is the perhaps most important one and the bulk of the inquiry was focused on that. So this is the privacy tort that's talked about every now and then and has come up again in the media lately. Uh, we had two main rounds of consultations with interested stakeholders in uh, late 2013, early 2014. The report was tabled in Parliament September 2014. Uh, uh, the, the next stage after it being tabled is that the government can choose to act on our recommendations but it's it's a matter for the government at that stage. So our inquiry that we've just completed builds on three previous inquiries and a, a fourth issues paper. Uh, in 2008 the ALRC conducted an inquiry into privacy law more generally and one of the outcomes of that was recommendations about reforms to the Privacy Act which led to the APPs uh, that Marcus has just gone through. So the, the reforms in 2014 came on the back of the ALRC's report. New South Wales Law Reform Commission in 2009 conducted an inquiry into privacy. Uh, in there they recommended that a privacy tort be introduced in New South Wales. Victorian Law Reform Commission in 2010 similarly re uh, recommended a privacy tort in Victoria. Uh, and sorry, I should say the ALRC in 2008 also recommended a privacy tort. But the three inquiries all had various differences. Uh, as I've said on the slide there, the, the seriousness threshold to make sure that only serious invasions can be uh, taken to court, uh, the fault requirement whether you need to show intention or just negligence uh, and a few other things where the reports differed. In 2011 the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet released an issues paper and received a lot of submissions uh, but that didn't progress beyond the issues paper stage. Uh, and the South Australian Law Reform Institute is now conducting their own inquiry into whether South Australia should have a privacy tort. Uh, so in the current inquiry the ALRC made 62 recommendations including the, the design of the tort, um, elements that the plaintiff would need to prove, defences, remedies, jurisdiction, uh, i.e. whether it should be a federal tort or a, a state tort. Uh, 
issues of awarding damages for emotional distress and breach of confidence actions, statutory cause of action for harassment. I should point out both of those, the breach of confidence and uh, harassment recommendations were only if the privacy tort were not enacted, so they're an alternative to a privacy tort. We also made some recommendations about surveillance device laws and regulatory reform. So one of the things we looked at in this inquiry was the current privacy protections that are in place and of course there are quite a lot, obviously the Privacy Act is the big one. We were at pains to make sure that we didn't design a tort that would overly duplicate existing law, so some duplication is perhaps unavoidable, but we, we wanted to make sure that it wouldn't be excessive. So we looked at these existing laws, uh, the Privacy Act, State and Territory Information Privacy Laws, which have similar uh, effect to the Privacy Act, but the state organisations. It's worth pointing out there that not all the states and territories have information privacy laws, so that's, that's a potential gap across the nation. Health privacy laws, telecommunications privacy, so the Federal Telecommunications Act puts some limits on disclosure of communications information. Various criminal offences, the uh, Commonwealth Criminal Code has an offence for using telecommunications services to menace, harass or cause offence. And of course state and territory criminal laws also have um, offences for indecent photography, so um, taking a photo of someone in the nude is, is a common one. Victoria has just introduced some laws around sexting, um, things of that nature. And the surveillance devices, device laws mentioned before, which create criminal offences for the use of surveillance devices like microphones, um, video recorders in particular situations, so whether it's a private activity or a private conversation. There are also various uh, common law protections of privacy. One is breach of confidence, this is perhaps the big one. Uh, if you release confidential information, then you might be liable for an action in breach of confidence. There are some limits to breach of confidence. Uh, private information isn't necessarily confidential, usually it would presumably be, but there may be exceptions. It do, a breach of confidence doesn't offer much protection against intrusion into seclusion, which is a phrase that gets used in discussion of the privacy tort for um, invading somebody's personal space, uh, trespassing on their property would be one example, but you can perhaps imagine other examples. Um, it's unclear whether, in fact beyond unclear, it, it doesn't seem that you can take action or get redress for a breach of confidence if you only suffer mere emotional distress that falls short of a, a psychiatric illness. Uh, there's some developing case law, well, in the UK it's fairly clear that you can take a breach of confidence action for mere emotional distress. In Australia there's some move in that direction but it's, it's not established. Uh, defamation is another existing law. Defamation protects people against damage to reputation, not an invasion of privacy. So there may be some overlap but they're essentially different, uh, different laws. Uh, two other common law areas that aren't mentioned on the slides but are worth mentioning uh, trespass to the personal property. If somebody invades your personal space by breaking into your home, that's an invasion of privacy in one sense, but more obviously it's a trespass. Uh, and nuisance is similarly a way that you can affect somebody's um, seclusion by, for example, setting up surveillance cameras, pointing at their property. Uh, it's an invasion of privacy, but it's, it's already actionable as nuisance in appropriate cases, not all cases, and there are some significant gaps there. So the Privacy Act, as Marcus has gone through, is, is obviously the big one. Uh, there are some exemptions that are fairly significant. Marcus mentioned employee records. Media organisations are exempt from the Privacy Act. Small businesses with less than 3 million annual turnover and individuals are generally exempt unless they're acting as a small business in certain cases. Um, so with those exemptions and the, the limited protection from intrusion into seclusion under the Privacy Act, which is just information privacy, the Privacy Act doesn't offer a complete, uh, complete protection against all invasions of privacy, although it does of course offer some. There's some case law in Australia dealing with a tort of privacy developing uh, 
Victoria Park Racing and Recreation Grounds and Taylor, the High Court in 1937 said that you uh, that there was no tort for privacy in the common law of Australia. And then in ABC and Lena Gay Meads in 2001, the High Court said actually it, it's open and there could be development uh, in this area. And since ABC and Lena, there have been a few lower courts recognising the cause of action, but no higher courts, and it's it's very unclear that uh, the common law is moving in that direction. There was a recent case, Giller and Prokopitz, in Victoria. Uh, now this looked at a, an extension of the breach of confidence action, which if it was picked up would uh, potentially cover the invasion of privacy, at least for disclosure of information. Uh, the, the story in this case was that the defendant and the plaintiff were in a relationship. The defendant made a video, an intimate video uh, of the two of them. When the relationship broke down, the defendant started sending copies of the video to the plaintiff's family and uh, as you can imagine that caused a lot of distress. And then the most recent development on this point has been the, uh, the three Law Reform Commission inquiries that I mentioned before, none of which I should say have actually been acted upon on, on the point of the privacy tort, so it's still um, still open. We didn't, in this inquiry, because of our terms of reference, look at whether there should be a tort or not, although, as I just mentioned, those other inquiries did say there should be a tort. Um, but we did look at whether there were benefits in statutory action rather than common law development. Um, they're listed there, but very quickly, with legislation, there's more scope for public consultation, uh, considering all the cases. It's it's less of a case-by-case -case development, which is what the common law does when it develops. And there's also scope to look at um, defences that might need to be worked into the common law through a lengthy process. And through legislation, you can put them in it uh, at uh, stage one. So, these are just some of the issues that we considered. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory, I think. The importance of privacy, the new technology that has come out since the earlier inquiries, so social media has increased. Uh, the use of drones, remote uh, aircraft, which can carry a video camera, fly over somebody's balcony and take a photo of them in the bathroom, for example. Uh, smartphones are everywhere now. Freedom of expression is, of course, a big issue here. Um, there's, there's some tension between privacy and freedom of expression. They also do complement each other a little bit. If you have no privacy, it's harder to freely express your opinion uh, because you're, you're being watched while you do it. Other public interests, um, national security is one, the uh, development of the economy, uh, internet activity, various other other things. Uh, impacts on the media. The media, of course, were very interested in, in what we had to say here and are worried about a privacy tort impacting on, on their actions uh, because, of course, if, if a politician is revealed to be corrupt, it's good for society and for the media to be able to reveal that. The, pri the uh, politician could well argue that it's a private matter and shouldn't be revealed. So there's, there's a tension there that needs to be resolved. Uh, business impacts, we don't want to overburden businesses with regulation. Because the Privacy Act and other laws are already there, it would be bad to bring in another law that created just an additional uh, compliance headache and we wanted to avoid that. And flexibility of the law and certainty of the law, I suppose a self-explanatory that the uh, law should be able to adapt but it shouldn't be so vague that people don't know what their obligations and rights are. Um, these are some guiding principles that we, we included in the inquiry. They're fairly similar to the uh, previous slide, so I won't run through those again. Okay, so these, these are the elements of the tort. This is what a plaintiff would need to prove to uh, to get an action off the ground in the court. So, if my privacy, if I think my privacy is invaded by somebody else, if I want to sue them in court, this is what I have to show. First thing is that the invasion. Uh, invasion of privacy occurred either by intrusion into seclusion or private affairs, which is the, the idea mentioned before that somebody gets into your personal space, uh, either physical space or they pry into your information by reading a diary or, or something like that. Uh, or it could be by misuse or disclosure of private information about the plaintiff. 
I imagine for a lot of businesses, the second one is the, the relevant issue uh, and it overlaps, of course, with the Privacy Act requirements. Uh, the, the next element to be proven is that the invasion is intentional or reckless. Uh, I'll go into that in a little more detail on the next slide. The plaintiff has to show that they had a reasonable expectation of privacy. The court has to be, con uh, must consider that the invasion of privacy was serious and the court must be satisfied that the public interest in privacy outweighs any countervailing public interest. And I'll go into those all in a little more detail. Uh, so this is just the two types of invasion point. We explicitly excluded uh, invasions of privacy through false light, pu uh, publishing information that puts the plaintiff in a false light and appropriating the plaintiff's name or likeness. Those are both causes of action in the US. We felt that they weren't significant here and that it was better to focus on what we took to be the, the key ways in which privacy could be invaded. Intentional recklessness. So the plaintiff has to prove that the invasion, of, that the defendant either intended to invade privacy or was reckless and invaded privacy through our, uh, recklessness. We, some stakeholders asked for it to be, um, or encouraged us to extend this to negligence or strict liability. Negligence, um, we felt, was just too wide and it would cover simple mistakes. So. Um, if I accidentally emailed somebody something uh, to, the, to the wrong email address, so I mean to send it to Bill and I send it to Bob, I potentially would suddenly be liable. And it's so easy to make that kind of mistake that we thought this would just be too broad, have too great a chilling effect on everyone. Uh, strict liability for similar reasons we excluded. It's worth pointing out that the Privacy Act is effectively um, going to cover the negligence and strict liability. So if you... Um, disclose information in in a breach of the APPs, it's not really a matter, it doesn't matter too much whether you intended to or you were just negligent about it, you will have breached the APPs. Uh, fault generally hasn't been an issue overseas, so in the UK, Canada and New Zealand, there's uh, similar laws on, on privacy torts, but it's generally pretty clear in those cases that the invasion was intentional. It's, somebody deliberately publishing uh, a piece of information in order to blackmail a celebrity or things of that nature. Okay, um, reasonable expectation of privacy. The idea here is that there needs to be an element of objectivity in here. Because privacy is very hard to define, anybody could say, uh, my address is, is private information and it may be that it's not private information. Um, a, a person in the position of the plaintiff might not expect that to be private because it's in the white pages, for example. So this test introduces a little bit of uh, an objective standard into, into matters and it's also a common test overseas. So it means that if Australian courts were trying to decide if a plaintiff had a reasonable expectation of privacy, they could look at a case in the UK and uh, take that into consideration. And the circumstances of the plaintiff might be relevant considerations here. So if the plaintiff is a politician, they may have less of an expectation of privacy. If the invasion, the claimed invasion happened uh, at a beach, they may have less expectation of privacy. If the recorded activity was uh, trivial or not private at all, then they might have less expectation of privacy compared to if uh, it was a video camera installed in somebody's bathroom where they would have a greater expectation of privacy, one would imagine. So the seriousness element is a threshold to make sure that people can't bring actions for trivial invasions. So uh, the uh, revealing somebody's a home address might not be a serious invasion, but publishing naked photos of somebody would probably be a serious uh, invasion. There was some discussion about whether serious was too broad a word or too vague. Um, ultimately, we need a threshold in a law like this. The LRC uh, considers that we need a, a threshold and any threshold is going to be a little bit vague, but seriousness seems to set the bar about right. 
privacy and the public interest. Uh, the court has to be satisfied that the public interest in privacy outweighs any countervailing public interest. So if a plaintiff is clearly somebody who, uh, or if, if the subject matter is clearly of public interest, such as a revelation of a politician's corruption, then uh, the plaintiff would need to show that their privacy outweighed the countervailing public interest. Uh, one, one point there is that this recommendation is, is recognising that there's a public interest in privacy, not just a private interest. And I think this is perhaps a, a good broad point that privacy isn't necessarily just about protecting an individual, it's about establishing trust in, uh, for example, online commerce. If, if consumers or customers don't think that their privacy is going to be protected, then uh, that, that's going to harm everyone. And that extends, we think, to the broader society that uh, if, if privacy is not respected, society is going to suffer to, in some sense. Uh, one, one final point there, sorry, is that having this upfront balancing test removes the need for a defense for public interest, which otherwise would be an important thing to include. No requirement, no requirement to prove harm. Um, this is a fairly short point, just that it's it's difficult to prove that you suffered any sort of harm, so it's not an additional requirement of the cause of action per our recommendations that you prove that not only was there a serious invasion of privacy and you had a reasonable expectation of privacy, etc. You don't also then need to prove that um, you suffered nervous shock or, or some other injury. Um, the other the other elements we think are enough to avoid any sort of frivolous claims. So we have a range of defences here. One that's significant, I suppose, is consent. Uh, now, consent comes up a lot in the Privacy Act as well. So if if a business, for example, collects information and obtains consent before doing that, then that's going to be a, a fairly strong defence. Uh, various other ones. Then necessity, if it's necessary to disclose somebody's private information because there's a medical emergency, then there's a defense of necessity. Lawful authority, if you're required to turn over information to, say, a regulator or an investigation, then that's a defense. Um, incidental to the exercise of a lawful right of defense of persons or property, it's not, we, we don't think it should be an actionable invasion of privacy if you had to do it because somebody was about to um, attack you and somehow or other releasing personal information or getting into their personal space, if that would protect you, then that should be okay. Remedies, uh, I think these are all fairly straightforward. We've recommended that there should be, uh, a plaintiff should be able to retrieve damages. There should be injunctions. Uh, if, if somebody's about to publish information, you should be able to ask the court to prevent that. Delivery up, destruction or removal of material. If somebody has a photo of someone else in the bathroom, the plaintiff should be able to require, uh, require that, sorry, request an order that the photographs are destroyed. Um, obviously, that's problematic in, in the online world where the photos are going to be replicated very quickly on, say, Facebook. Uh, but in some cases, it will be a useful, useful uh, remedy. I'll race ahead because it's, 1254. Um, breach of confidence, I mentioned before that we re recommended that if the tort weren't enacted, breach of confidence should be extended. Between that and harassment, um, so following somebody around, reading their private letters, an ongoing, an ongoing uh, activity that is effectively intruding into their seclusion, between extending breach of confidence and harassment, we think that you get a similar result to introducing the tort, but it would be a much more specific way to go about it. So surveillance device laws. Um, all the states and territories have some sort of surveillance device laws, but there are significant differences. Some states and territories only have listing device laws, some have optical device laws. Uh, data and tracking devices are there in a couple of jurisdictions as well. We've recommended that these should be made uniform. Stakeholders from business and from um, privacy advocacy areas all supported this idea. Uh, if you're a business and you're running in New South Wales and Victoria, it just creates an extra burden to have to have two different 
uh, legal regimes to, to navigate. We recommended getting rid of a participant monitoring exception, which exists in a couple of jurisdictions at the moment, that if you're party to a conversation, it's okay to record it, even if the other people don't know. We felt that that was an invasion of privacy that, uh, that shouldn't be, be allowed. But to balance that out, there is a defense of responsible journalism. And the surveillance device laws also include defenses of consent and necessity and, and various other, uh, other things. Workplace surveillance laws, surveillance laws are also in a fairly inconsistent state. Only three states have any surveillance laws, New South Wales, ACT and Victoria, and they, uh, they differ quite a bit in, in a few ways. So for example, New South Wales and ACT allow for covert surveillance authorities where an employer can go to a, court, uh, to a magistrate and request an authorization to install covert surveillance. Um, the New South Wales and ACT laws also have restrictions on email and web blocking, and there are provisions in there for uh, allowing an employer to conduct surveillance if they provided, say, a laptop to an employee and the employee uses that from home, then that, that's a different uh, situation. We've also recommended some regulatory reforms. One is to uh, give the OAIC some powers in response to serious invasions of privacy, uh, which would extend past the information privacy complaints process that exists at the moment. In 2008, ALRC recommended getting rid of the small business exemption. In 2014, we've suggested looking at other ways to increase the privacy protections under the Privacy Act regarding small businesses. Uh, so that could be an accreditation system, a limited removal of the exemption so that a small business that collects sensitive personal information would still be bound. Uh, but we didn't make a recommendation on, on a particular mechanism there. So I mentioned that the report's been tabled. Um, there's still ongoing interest in this. The iCloud photos where various celebrities had their uh, nude photos leaked was obviously a big, uh, big media topic. Barry Spurs emails just recently and Nova Paris, uh, they've raised a lot of these issues again. Arguably there's a public interest in what Barry Spurs said, arguably there isn't. Um, that, that's ongoing at the moment in court. And the use of drones was uh, discussed in the House of Reps Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs. And they, they recommended something like a privacy tort or similar protection. Uh, um, yeah, actually, uh, look, looking at the time, I think we might uh, we might wrap it up there. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcus and Stephen, for all that information. We certainly covered a lot of ground. Uh, for those of you that posted some uh, questions, what we might do is um, uh, ask uh, Marcus and Stephen whether they might be able to tackle a couple of those questions for us, and we'll publish them uh, as. Um, uh, Q&As on uh, Workplace Info in the future. So we hope you found today's session useful. Please feel, feel free to drop us a line at editor at workplaceinfo.com.au if you have any follow-up questions. And make sure you log on to Workplace Info for the latest info on compliance and best practices for HR, IR, and work safety professionals. If you want to revisit some of today's presentation, an archive will be published on our YouTube channel to watch and listen to at your leisure. We'll be including that URL in our follow-up correspondence. We'll also be sending you some information about the new privacy legislation, which will help you get your head around this new legislation. Our next webinar is going to be on the 26th of November, and it will deal with approaches to reducing bullying in your organization. We'll have discussions from experts Larry Forsyth from Australian Business Consulting and Solutions and Joe Moore from Kimber Moore & Associates. We thank you very much for your time and wish you the best of luck with your work.